tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. <laughs> Good evening. I'm storyteller Otis Gyre, and I ain't your grandfather. From where I'm from, we don't do bedtime stories. And if that's what you were expecting, you're in the wrong place. If it's terrifying tales you're after, well then, I've got just the thing. Get comfortable, settle in. Turn off the lights, if you dare. Your night is about to get a whole lot darker. <laughs> Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs> Good evening, you're listening to Scary Stories Told in the Dark. Welcome to Season 6, Episode 2, I'm your host, Otis Jiry. In tonight's episode, I'll be performing four stories for you. Back on Season 5, Episode 17, we tried something a bit different when I brought five tales back from the proverbial grave, pulled from the pages of an iconic horror fiction magazine. I heard from many of you that you greatly enjoyed these twisted, timeless tales from yesteryear. And so today, I'm back with four more to make your blood run cold. As before, all of the tales in this program are in the public domain and were originally published in December 1924's edition of Weird Tales, the American fantasy and horror fiction pulp magazine that gave writers such as H.P. Lovecraft and Clark Ashton Smith their starts. Tonight's featured authors may not be household names, but their tales, though largely lost to the sands of time, will be given new life as I tell them aloud. I hope you enjoyed listening to them as much as I did, bringing them back to life. You're listening to the standard edition of tonight's program, which contains the first two terrifying tales. If you'd like to show your support and enjoy an extended version of this and other episodes with twice the terror, visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today. Thank you for your support. Now, it's time to take a walk together down the moonlit trail. So lock your doors... Turn your lights down low and settle in. The show is about to begin. <laughs> Our first tale tonight comes from author C. Franklin Miller. In it, a man on a scientific expedition in the deepest, darkest areas of Africa encounters someone of unmistakably foreign origin under less than ideal circumstances. When he heads out for an excursion of his own later on, he learns that things are not what they seem, not by a long shot. Without further ado, I present to you his family. The elemental love of a man for his family will take queer turns at times, but for sheer horror, none of the famous tragedies of history can equal the warped, affection which forms the basis of the incident I'm about to narrate. It happened in the heart of that vast, uninhabited country drained by the Upper Congo, some 200 miles from civilization's nearest outpost. As a member of the Denkla Geographic Expedition, I'd spent nearly a year in the wild interior collecting a mass of scientific data for the society we represented. While the task at hand had been a fascinating one, I could feel myself growing dull and sluggish, 
mentally as well as physically, under the devitalizing rays of the African sun. My notebook recalls the date as June 14, 1890, when we emerged from the swamp-infested inland and again set eyes on the sullen waters of the dominating Congo. The sight was but a welcome one. To us it meant but a five days' journey to the comfort and contentment of a white man's home. We pitched our tents on the angle of land formed by a tiny rivulet and the growing expanse of the master stream. The sun had dipped far down behind the towering trees to the west by the time our camp chores were completed and the comparative coolness of the early evening had sprung up. Wearied by the arduous tasks of the day, I indulged in a leisurely pipe and prepared to retire immediately. Upon entering my tent, I discovered, with wondering eyes, a long, gaping rent in the canvas opposite, clean-cut and new. From outside there sounded the soft thud of flying feet. I plunged through the opening in time to see a dim figure disappear into the tangled undergrowth of the darkening jungle. Investigation developed that a rifle, several boxes of cartridges, and two scientific books, which we carried for reference, were missing. Apparently nothing else had been tampered with. A guard was mounted on the encampment that night, but the mysterious marauder never returned. Stretched out on my cot, I pondered over the puzzling occurrence for some time. That the theft had been perpetuated by a white man I knew. The form which had scurried into the leafy undercover of the jungle was not that of a dark-skinned native. This was a riddle in itself for the men who penetrate any distance into the wilds of the world are men of purpose who find no time for petty thievery. But the nature of the loot was as much of a wonder as the race of the man. Apparently no food had been sought. And why the books? Why the books? I could frame no satisfactory answer and fell asleep presently with that query weaving monotonously through my brain. High noon of our third day in that locality had found me some distance inland on a little hunting excursion of my own. I'd about decided to retrace my steps back to camp when I brought up suddenly in astonishment that the section of the dark continent should harbor any civilized inhabitants was beyond belief, but away to my left, Cunningly hidden behind the dense foliage of the matted trees stood a cabin. There was no sign of human life about the place, not even the semblance of a pathway, but the very existence of a permanent man-made shack so far removed from any settlement was mystery enough to stir the blood of any adventurous soul. I started forward slowly with the vague idea of unearthing some strange jungle secret and emerged presently upon a little clearing from where I surveyed the place with doubtful eyes. Few tools and very little skill had been utilized in the erection of that cabin. There were no windows. The wall logs were undaubed and irregular, some of them jutting far out at the corners, while the ill-fitting door, sagging pathetically upon rope hinges, gave to the whole a grotesque appearance. But it was not so much the appearance of the place as the intangible atmosphere of horror enveloping it which held me. Instinctively I distrusted that abandoned silence which seemed to beckon so innocently. Some brooding evil lay hidden there, waiting with cunning patience for the springing of a trap but like the venturesome fool I was, I approached and laid my weight cautiously against the door. To my surprise it resisted, and for a moment I speculated as to the wisdom of indulging my curiosity any further. That barred door indicated the presence of someone. Even as I hesitated, a man's soft drawling voice sounded from within, holding me rigid with amazement. I'll paddle down to the settlement next week, honey, and see if I can't pick up some new books for you. 
Reckon daughter can attend you satisfactorily until I return. Now try to sleep. Soothingly. You'll feel better in a little while. Women living in this godforsaken spot? And a man of breeding, if I were of any judge. The whole thing was preposterous, but such was the evidence my hearers had gathered. Thinking that I could possibly be of some service in case of illness, I raised the butt end of my rifle and rapped. A deep silence followed. For a moment, I experienced that unpleasant sensation of being passed upon by hidden eyes, and then the door slowly opened. Involuntarily, I recoiled a step, scarcely knowing what to expect. A tall, broad-shouldered man appeared. There was in his carriage a certain flash of dignity which could not be concealed by the tattered garments he wore. His hair was gray and fell in wild disorder to his shoulders, framing a countenance seen by years of suffering. For a moment he regarded me with deep-set, weary eyes. Then, "'You are welcome, sir,' he said, quietly in the same soft-toned drawl, and stood aside me to enter. I did so, feeling vaguely that the whole occurrence was a fragment of some senseless dream. The interior was fitfully illuminated by the daylight, which filtered in between the undaubed logs, revealing a picture of strange barrenness. Except for a few sawed-off logs, evidently serving as chairs, in a large upturned box in the center, the room was bare of furnishings. Across one end of the structure was draped a long black cloth, which no doubt concealed the women. My strange host closed the door without barring it, and when I turned I found his eyes searching me with an unfathomable expression which was decidedly unpleasant. "'You'll pardon my intrusion,' I said a bit awkwardly. I spied your cabin on my way back to camp and thought, "'I could be of some service. My name is Brent.' "'Glad to meet you, sir,' he answered. "'Visitors are a rare luxury with us. "'My name is Warner, Colonel Warner of Kentucky.' There was a surprising power in his handclasp. Unfortunately, the women are somewhat indisposed at present. But I'll tell them that you called, Mr. Brent. Won't you be seated, sir? I sank down upon the nearest log, a highly perplexed man. The formality of it all would have been laughable were it not for the serious dignity of this surprising colonel. So far as he was concerned... We might have met in the drawing-room of some southern mansion. As for myself, I could not throw off the sense of tragedy which seemed to lurk beneath the surface. Visibly, there was nothing to fear, but the events of the last few minutes were too unnatural to put me at ease. Of a sudden, my roving eyes settled on the familiar lines of a pair of shabby-looking books resting on the box close by. I stared, and the colonel, evidently noticing my gaze, took up one of the volumes. "'An excellent discourse, sir,' said he, proffering me the volume, but highly technical. "'Have you ever read it?' I've thumbed the well-known cover. On the flyleaf, in my own handwriting, appeared my scrawly signature, James W. Brent, one of the best treaties on the subject in existence, I declared. Decidedly, I got it only a few days ago for Miss Warner. She loves books but finds reading a hardship. Her sight is dim. So I read things aloud to her. We found that very interesting, sir. With a sigh, which was half moan, he subsided upon a log near the opposite wall, and I returned the book to its companion. Undoubtedly, it was my own, but I found it difficult to believe that this well-bred gentleman, however peculiar, had committed the theft. I gazed at him curiously and found him staring vacantly into space with sagging jaw. Finally, he spoke in a queer, detached manner. Colonel Warner. It seems like ages since I heard that name. The Mad Colonel. 
That's what they call me. Then suddenly, have you ever heard them tell of the mad colonel? I had not. No matter. And he waved his hand in dismission of the thought. You would not feel so secure in my presence with their wild tales running through your brain. I am not mad, and his tone was a shade of wonder. Only the victim of a terrible vengeance. Do you see those pictures, Mr. Brandt? I had overlooked them before, two small photographs, framed in black, hanging on a wall behind me, one of an elderly lady, beautiful beyond doubt, the other of a captivating youngster. My family, Mr. Brandt. His eyes fairly glowed with the pleasure of the telling, but promptly recovered their weary expression. We were happy once back in Kentucky, a rich family and well-known, but disaster overtook us in the shape of a hopeless maniac, Andrew Lang. For a moment he was silent, staring down at the floor with bent head, his gray hair falling about his face. I glanced around, trying to conjure up some excuse for leaving. I had no desire to probe into his family secrets. Besides, that tense atmosphere of horror that overhung the place was anything but reassuring. I wanted to be gone, rather the wild things of the jungle than to be cooped up with what? I did not know, but I could sense some hidden terror and involuntarily my eyes wandered to that crepe-like drapery which divided the cabin. I started to speak, but his soft voice interrupted, ignoring me completely. I was telling you of Andrew Lang, the madman. I trusted him like a brother and thought he was grateful until I discovered his perfidy, lies and soft-tongued entreaties were his stock in trade. It was Mrs. Warner he wanted, sir. Cunning indeed were his methods. I killed him. I could scarcely repress a shudder. The whole thing was beginning to get on my nerves, but I could not stay his soft-toned drawl. Insanity had been the family blood of Andrew Lang. All four of his sons were afflicted. For years they haunted me from place to place, vowing to avenge their father's death with cruel torture. But I felt justified. The honor of the Warner name, my wife's happiness, my little Helen. His voice trembled. Tears started to his eyes. Then he drew himself erect with military dignity. Legally, I am a murderer, sir and the law would not protect me from those four warped brains. I fled the country with my little family and took refuge here, in the heart of the jungle, where I thought I would be safe. But those cunning brains found me at last. His shoulders drooped and his form relaxed into the very picture of despair. When he spoke again, his voice was dull, expressionless, First one came, then the other disguised, but I knew them, and in self-defense, I killed them. For a moment I thought the man was mad. His tale was fantastic enough, but one look at his forlorn figure seemed to reassure me. Sorrow and suffering were all the picture held. I was about to utter some words of sympathy when the door of the shack flew open and a harsh voice intruded. I started erect with quickened pulse. Framed in the doorway was a man clad in the khaki of the border rangers. One hand was poised lightly on the automatic in his belt. His eyes burned with triumph as they rested on the bent figure of the colonel, who had scarcely moved. So we've got you at last, grimly. At last, echoed the colonel, dully, and a hell of a chase it was. Two others were not so successful. You have no idea what happened to them. It was more of an accusation than a question. I killed them, as I will you, was the colonel's toneless reply. Why, damn you, Mad Hyde, exploded the stranger wrathfully. I'll... Mad? 
Mad? The colonel was on his feet with wildly glaring eyes, his hands working spasmodically. You call me mad? Suddenly he leapt forward, and one powerful arm shot out. Recoiling, I stepped, the stranger whipped out his automatic. Simultaneously, I brought the butt of my rifle down on his arm. Something cracked, a low moan escaped his lips, and his weapon clattered to the floor. Then the colonel was upon him, his powerful hands clutched in a death grip on the stranger's throat. I tried to pull him off. It was useless. The stranger's face turned purple, and his body sagged. Then the colonel's rage subsided, and with a hissing intake of breath, he let his victim slip through his hands into a lifeless heap on the floor. A sickening nausea swept me at the hideous sight. I shuddered and turned away. The colonel seized my hand in his, and I could feel him tremble. Thank you, sir, he whispered. God only knows what would have become of my family. He was the third. His voice faltered, and my heart went out to him in pity in spite of the murder just committed. Then, with a sudden movement, he turned and bent over the dead body of his enemy. Grasping the limp form beneath the armpits, he started to drag it across the rough boards of the cabin, and presently disappeared behind that mysterious barrier of black without a backward glance. A gruesome object to lay before the eyes of that unseen family of his. I studied that swaying curtain with puzzled eyes, trying to penetrate its secrets, and gradually grew conscious of a thin stream of red slowly oozing from beneath its low-hanging folds. I stared motionless, my brain beset with wild imaginations. Surely that slowly creeping line of red was blood. What thing of evil had I stumbled upon? What horror did that stable cloth conceal? I tiptoed across the floor and gently pulled back the curtain at one side. A weird sight met my eyes. The colonel was kneeling before an upturned box, his body bent like a worshipper before a shrine. Beside him, where he knelt, rested three shaggy human heads, one still wet with blood, while a decapitated form in bloodstained khaki lay huddled in a far corner. I heard the colonel speak, a horribly elated whisper. You're safe, honey. He'll never get you. He can't. We'll fool them all. All. And he laughed. I stared with something akin to fascination at the repulsive sight. Suddenly he turned, sensing my presence. Come in, sir, he cried. Come in and meet the family. Mrs. Warner and little Helen. I saw that his eyes were bulging and his face working in a frenzy of maniacal emotion. With a cat-like movement, he sprang to his feet, disclosing the idols of his worship, his family resting sphinx-like on the box before him, two empty, grinning skulls. A terrible weakness assailed me as I staggered away from that place of madness into the sanity of broad daylight. Five days later, on arriving at the settlement downstream, I learned that three rangers had been sent out after the mad colonel somewhere up the river and that none had returned. I held my peace. I hope you enjoyed His Family by author C. Franklin Miller as performed by yours truly. Up next, we've got a second terrifying tale for you, this one from author Elwyn J. Owens. In it, half a dozen mysterious men clad in robes kidnap an elderly man with the intention of robbing him, and worse. But crime doesn't always pay, particularly when you have no idea who or what you're dealing with. <laughs> Without further ado, I present to you Black Temple Band. 
Halt! Seize him. Throttle his throat. Bind him hand and foot. The burlap about him. And to the car. The steel-like commands followed each other in well-timed succession. The voice of the leader was purposely muffled. And each word was clear-cut, sharply, and quickly spoken. With measured step from out the quietude of the partially illuminated, seemingly deserted street, six men had emerged. They offered not a comment, neither did they tarry. Each man knew his particular part of the program, and all acted quickly and with precision. In the twinkling of an eye, the aged Clegg Panzer, gagged, bound, and heavily wrapped in a covering that smelled of harness leather, was lifted from his feet. The leader signaled the others to follow. They pushed through the willowy brush and behind the large signboards that hid them from the street. Across the vacant lot they went to the darkness of the alley. The plank and strap him. The leader's words were more stern, more frigid than before. Panzer was stood upright and two men held him thus, while three others placed the plank at his back. Three surcingles were slipped about him, one at his feet, one about his waist, and one about his shoulders, and all were tightly drawn. They'll make a fine specimen of a mummy when we're done with him, jeered one in an undertone. The leader sprang quickly forward and, touching the speaker lightly on the arm, spoke in low, cautious tones. This, I deem, is no place for jest. The guardians of the city's peace may soon be upon us. Leave your tormenting until we are in the distant spot, secure from the jurisdiction of courts and the eyes of men. The leader swung quite around and gestured toward the waiting truck. Slide the burlap body in and let it lie flat on the vehicle's metal bed. A murmured word, and the helpless panzer was tipped backward and lifted and slipped within the waiting car. Two men mounted to the driver's seat. One sat on either of the flaring sides and two climbed in at the rear. The motor spun. There was a grinding of the meshing gears, and soon they were out upon the city's thoroughfare. With darkened lamps, the car crept on to the unpaved streets of the sleeping suburbs. A quick turn that threw the bound body to one side, and the motor belched aloud. Now they were safe. The lights flared out into the murkiness of an unlighted night. Down went the lever on the quadrant, and the car lunged forward furiously. On and on they went, over rough and smooth, uphill and down, a black humming demon in the stillness of a damp, pitch-black night. There was a whispered word. The motor was slowed down, and at a divergence of the road, the car leapt to the left. For miles they bumped along a narrow timber flank byway. Again the engine ceased to labor. The brakes creaked and squealed. The car stopped suddenly. We've arrived, came a voice from the driver's seat. Three distinct taps on the floor of the car. All out, rasped six voices in unison. Twelve human feet hit the leaf-strewn ground at the same instant. All went to the rear of the car. Six black-robed men faced toward the bound one. It was the leader's frigid monotone that rent the moment's silence. Unbuckle the straps that hold him to the plank. Remove the burlap, untie his feet, but give him not the freeness of his hands. Five men took their places quickly, each man to his particular task. Panzer was dragged out and stood upright. The men worked fast, and soon he was blinking, in the dazzling glare of a powerful electric bulb. Six men with coal-black beards of equal length formed in a semicircle in front of him, each dressed in black, a tight cap of the same color pulled far down over his ears. Panzer glanced from one to the other. His lips were for a moment paralyzed. Again he momentarily gazed at each of the six men in turn, his small blue eyes glistened under the gray canopy of his hair. His emaciated face quivered. His purple lips parted, and he breathed long and deeply. 
The Black Temple Band. He gasped aloud. You're right, for once, you old image maker, sneered one. You super mystic, hissed another with a fiendish smile. I am not the maker of the lifelike skeleton figures, pleaded Panzer. Lavilli is the creator. Ha <laughs> ha, sneered the leader. Tis none but Panzer's hand that shapes the images of our dead and makes them mechanically perfect that this degraded Luvilli may use them for his designing purposes. A disgrace. A sardonic hiss went round the semicircle. Panzer's deep, sunken blue eyes snapped. His wan face grew tense, and the straight-cut, livid lips parted. Then you, that you do accuse me, must be the husband of the leather dealer's wife, he asserted firmly. "'Twas your burlap that a heavy hand clapped quickly over the speaker's mouth, and a deep voice sounded. No more of this. You know one of our number, we admit. By studying deeper your acknowledgment and the rapid succession of thoughts you pursued to arrive at this recognition, prove to us that you are unquestionably the one whom we did this night seek. Silence, commanded the leader. Speak no longer thus in so densely timbered a place. He turned to the gray-haired man. Guide us to Lavelli's palace cave. Why is it that you cannot go alone, since you have come this far unguided? Parley not with questioning, retorted the leader gruffly. We cannot find our way in this entangled labyrinth. We know there are secret wirings here and do not care to meet our fate at the hands of such an unscrupulous wretch as you. Then, in firmer tones, lead on, and say no more. Panzer was thoughtful for some moments. His aged head bowed low. Do you refuse? demanded the leader, directing the blinding glare of the light on the old man's face. Not I, declared Panzer, with quickened turn of mind. Unbind my hands so that I may be free to use my arms. His blue eyes met the leader's black ones squarely. Do this, and place in my care the electric bulb. I will show the way. Once started, you shall see all. Be the end what it will. Shall we witness your transformation? jeered one. No more such remarks, admonished the leader. Take the bindings from his arms. Soon the huge light was in Panzer's trembling hand, and he turned down the narrow trail that penetrated the timbered valley. Wait here, he said. I will clear the way. When I call, come at once. Panzer proceeded a little way on the rough, rock-stewn path. He stepped to a bush and pulled at the twig. Instantly the forest darkness was glittering with countless sparkling bulbs. A few paces more, and he reached into a pile of rocks. There was a shaking of the stone pathway, similar to the movements of a grain cleaner's screen. Suddenly, the rough pathway became as smooth and even a surface as a slab of polished marble. Come! cried Panzer. Six black robed men dashed forward quickly and were soon at the aged Panzer's side. The passage was lighter than the brightest day. The gray-haired man bowed in reflection, then, looking up, dashed a portable lamp upon the stone. "'What have you sought?' said he in a languished monotone. "'You soon shall see.' Slowly, as a funeral march, Panzer led them down the path of polished stone. Numerous lights glared brightly through the thick foliage of the overhanging branches and giant trees— thickly set in entangling underbrush on either side, walled them in. The aged one reeled weakly from side to side as he went, faltering on, while behind him trailed the six black-robed men, all with bowed heads. Panzer stopped suddenly and faced about. We're here, he stated in a solemn, quivering voice. The eyes of six black-caped men followed his directing finger, 
Before them was a perpendicular wall of stone, smoothly polished and apparently without joint or crevice. But where is the entrance? asked the leader, somewhat puzzled. It is here, right here before your eyes, declared the aged one in a cold, lifeless tone. Open quickly. We have no time to tarry, commanded the leader hastily. Be it so, agreed Panzer, reluctantly. I thought you might turn back. As his voice died out, he raised his slim white hands heavenward and pulled at a twig above his head. A vapor encircled him, and the rustling of the leaves ceased, and an infinite stillness crept over the spot. Then moans, as of unseen suffering humans, broke upon their ears. The white-haired man, for a second time, raised his hands and touched the broken branch, Slowly, steadily, the weird sounds died away. Remove your robes, black princes of the Black Temple Band. He paused a moment to give them ample time. The six men did not move. Obey my command, he said with a raise of voice. Delay not. No man can enter this place dressed in black. Tis Luvili's steadfast rule. "'Rules are not for us,' chimed six men in unison. Panzer laughed a sickening laugh. <laughs> "'You do not understand the seriousness of your tone,' said he. "'My life, as it is now, is worthless to me. "'An aged man in six murderers' hands. "'One touch, and through your six bodies, "'as well as the one I now enjoy,' Countless volts of electric current shall quickly pass. I give you time to reconsider. Shall I end it all? Six black robes fell instantly to the earth at the wearer's feet. The gray-haired man gazed intently toward the perpendicular wall of stone. He pushed a knot on a gnarled tree. Inch by inch, mechanically, quietly, the wall began to open at the top and tip gradually outward. Soon, a faint ray of light showed around the edges. Once started, the moving wall kept swinging down, as if hinged at the bottom. Purple-white lights now gleamed into the black-bearded faces of six statue-like men. As the stone wall continued downward, seeking slowly the level of the smooth entrance, the gray vapor became denser. Gradually, the men were separated from the outside world by the myriads of glistening, dancing crystals. When the wall rested horizontally at their feet, a mammoth eave lay open to their view. The purple light cast a ghastly glow over the spacious interior. A huge copper railing enclosed a massive table in which were hundreds of black buttons. Midway across the cave, from right to left, hung heavy drapes of gold and silver cloth. From the stone dome was suspended a giant hand-carved globe of countless facets, which divided the gleam of the powerful arc light into thread-like rays of violet and green and yellow hues. The once lowering wall now formed an entrance slab, mirroring the brilliancy of the richly carved cave. Panzer stepped forward and, pausing in the entrance, faced the eager band. "'Do you wish to see more?' he asked. "'Or will you leave me and return to the place from which you came?' "'We'll see all and see your finish, too,' declared the leader dryly. Panzer smiled a death-like smile. "'Then be it so.' Enter, black princes of the Black Temple Band. Walk steadily in single file, and touch not a single thing, for all within these walls are currently bearing devices of the village's master hand. Six men bowed acknowledgment of the aged one's command. Panzer turned mechanically and faced within. With timed cat-like tread he entered. One by one, the six black-caped men fell into line, and followed to the portals. With a wave of his bony arm, the aged panzer motioned them to form in single line about the outside of the polished copper railing. 
Quickly, he stepped to the large, polished table with its numerous buttons. He touched one of the black beads upon its surface. The massive entrance closed with the same mechanical precision as it had opened. Enough of this, cried one. Where are the figures? They are what we want to see. Whom are you imitating now? Again, the aged man laughed coldly. Be quick, commanded the leader, taking a step forward, but avoiding the rail in front of him. The long, tapering fingers of the aged man touched another button, another, and still another. One by one, little by little, the gold and silver drapes folded back, exposing the remainder of the cave. Neatly arranged in a semicircle about a moss-covered stagnant pool were wan, ivory-complexioned, human-like heads set upon thinly robed waxen forms. Glistening, half-closed eyes peered down upon the murky waters in a stony, death-like stare. Again, the withered fingers passed over the responding buttons. Steadily, languidly, simultaneously, a slim right arm of each of the mechanical figures raised. Panzer chuckled weakly, and his fingers pressed quickly upon others of the black buttons. The mechanical lips of the waxen heads parted. Beating time, the draped arms moved up and down. Panzer's small blue eyes turned warily to each of the six men in turn. All, save the leaders, caught his glance. He dashed around the circumference of the cave toward a waxen figure still incomplete. The white-haired man's fingers touched other buttons quickly, and figures ceased to move. His conciliatory smile was gone. His nervous face twitched in agony. He lunged forward, and in an instant was in pursuit of the leader. The leader reached the partly finished image, with Panzer close behind. He jerked aside a sheet. In the semi-darkened section before him lay the likeness of an incomplete human form, a counterpart in the clay. Wretch! the leader cried. You shall this night die! Come, men! Dash him into the green pool and hold his head submerged until he shall breathe no more. Panzer attempted to return to the table that he might extinguish the light, but six men held him fast and moved him toward the pool. Suddenly the leader drew back from the rest. Hold, men, he said thoughtfully. Let Panzer witness the wrecking of his fortune. Do not ruin my life's work, cried the white-haired man in despair. Please grant that I may exhibit it to an art-admiring world. Let me show that Lavilla's teaching has made of me a supermaster at the trade. Numerous patents are now pending. This wealth will I divide. Grant me my time that... Patents? Bah! Life! Three times bah, hissed the leader. One hold the guilty wretch. Others to the waxen form spare not one. Quickly... Five men dashed forward toward the silent likeness of life, leaving the white-haired man within the sixth one sturdy grip. A shriek of pain echoed throughout the cave, and five men halted in their steps. The leader had touched one of the forms lightly and had received a tingling sting. Mumbled words passed among the five men. The leader's eyes focused fiendishly upon the trembling Helpless Panzer, turn off the current, he commanded loudly. To do so, I must be free to return to the table, was Panzer's quick reply. You may, said the leader, but we will accompany you. Touch also the button that opens the heavy door. Hurriedly, they seized him and carefully avoided the encircled, polished copper railing. They rushed him to the button-covered slab. Quietly, the heavy door swung down. His fingers moved slowly, as if in agony. Momentarily, his hands rested on the buttons. His head raised, and the pallid lips parted. "'Tis done!' he gasped, his tear-filled eyes, raising to meet the black eyes of the leader of the gang. "'Save the images,' he pleaded. "'Save the images. 
for they are masterpieces of a master art. Lavilli has gone to barter them for a fortune, and still I hesitate to transfer ownership. For fifty years I toiled unceasingly upon them. Save them, I beg, even though I shall not live to see the light of day. Consider, men, should you, in a fit of hate, destroy the work it has taken a lifetime to perfect? Each bearded man stepped back, and each again studied the figures near the pool. Whispers went from ear to ear. The leader moved apart from the rest and addressed the aged panther. We grant you the request you make. His voice was low. Each word was slowly, carefully enunciated. Your images shall be spared, for we shall load them in the truck. They shall be sold. "'Twill pay us for our trip.' "'Me?' interrupted Panzer with bowed head. "'You have seen for a last time the summer's rising sun,' declared the leader frigidly. Turning to the men, the leader waved them round the railing. "'Go about your work and parley not,' he ordered. "'We will reap the reward of this miser's clandestine life.' One by one the images were carried through the opening and down the narrow stony path and carefully placed in the car. Tears coursed down the withered cheeks of the watchful, white-haired man as the last one passed from view. The leader seized him by the arm and started toward the pool. Panzer drew back. The leader called to his men and instantly they were at his side. Picking up the aged man, they carried him and stood him near the water's edge. Tear his garments into shreds, commanded the leader gruffly. Tie them around his worthless frame so that neither hands nor feet can move. This done, we shall hold him below the surface of this greenish pool. His voice sank to a deep, acrimonious bass. And let him... Die. Between parted lips, the aged panther clenched his pearly teeth and struggled in their gasp. Pushing backward and then forward, he moved the men close to the shiny copper rail. Suddenly he dropped upon his hands and knees and crawled. They pounced upon him, but their fingers slipped their hold. Dry as they would, his shoulders passed under the railing inch by inch. Rip the garments, ordered the leader. Hoarsely, we'll bind him when he stops. Under the polished copper railing, the struggling panzer crept. To stop him, two men unthinkingly braced against the current carrying rail. A painful groan. Panzer moved on untouched. Six pairs of eyes rolled painfully heavenward, and six men dropped, a quivering, lifeless mass. When the morning sun crept up the cloudless eastern sky, the weary panther, with a wan, solemn yet purposeful face, slowly guided the leading car down the city's quiet thoroughfare. The door to the well-hidden cave had been securely closed, never to swing again. The electric wirings had been stripped from the forest-furnished hangings, and what was dearer to the aged panther than life itself, his works had been saved to keep him company. I hope you enjoyed Black Temple Band by author Elwyn J. Owens, as performed by yours truly. As a reminder, all of tonight's tales were drawn from the December 1924 edition, Volume 4, Number 4, of the legendary pulp fiction magazine, Weird Tales. If you're interested in checking out more fantastic stories from that issue, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and check out the notes for today's episode. You'll find a link to where you can check out the entire issue, which contains not just the four tales performed today, but more than a dozen others. I think you'll find that even though nearly 100 years have passed 
since these spooky tales were published, that the same things that terrified previous generations still creep us out today. I suppose some things never change. I'd like to personally thank you for joining me for this episode of Scary Stories Told in the Dark. If you enjoyed what you've heard on today's program, please take a moment to stop by our iTunes page or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcast and leave us a five-star review and a kind word. It makes a huge difference, and it would mean a lot to us. If you'd like to hear a premium extended edition of tonight's and all of our other episodes featuring twice the terror, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click the Patrons link in the menu at the top of the screen. You'll find yourself at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com where you can purchase season passes for this podcast and our other quality storytelling programs. Or become a patron for as little as $5 per month and get access to our entire audio archive dating back to 2012, all of it ad-free. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all of our latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. You can subscribe to me on YouTube as well at the Otis Gyre channel, where you'll find releases of my series, Horror Story Time, dating back to 2014, and you can find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram too. Just search for Otis Gyre. Until next week, stay spooky and get some sleep, <laughs> if you can. <laughs>
Chilling tales for dark night.